Hello everybody and welcome. My name is Julie Mann and I show men and women how they can live healthy, happy, sustainable lives. And I'm really delighted because today I'm joined by Leanne Turner. Hi Leanne. Hello, how are you Julie? I'm good. So for those of you that don't yet know Leanne, she works as a voiceover artist and a speaking coach. Mm -hmm. All very exciting. So I think a great place to start Leanne would be to start you telling us about what life was like when you were a small girl. Well, um, when when I was smaller, like in, at home with, uh, so I'm raised in like a household of like five girls. So I'm child number five. Um, very busy home, obviously, five children, my mum and dad with all of our friends coming over. So you've always got a kind of almost shout to be heard in that size household with all your family, friends and cousins, everybody coming over. Um, and uh, our background is Jamaican, so we're very loud naturally anyway, we are as a people. Um, and so it'd often be a very busy household, lots of talking, lots of noise, lots of routine, school and then loads of clubs after, Monday clubs, Sunday, every, everything you can think of, we did an activity. So very busy growing up at school. Um, raised in East London, uh, my parents both worked and stuff, so very busy household and stuff, huge family, our family's huge and cousins huge and that, so it was just, I just remember it always been lots of fun, everyone used to come to our house, it was like a party all the time and Fridays was like takeaway Friday and it was just such a good time, so it was always fun growing up, noisy, parties, everything, always, it was great. Sounds brilliant, so, so Sounds like you had to shout loudest of all to get heard as the yes. <laughs> as the youngest. Girl. Yes. Yes. So yes. I know that our families have enormous influence over us, don't they? And they teach us all sides, so all kinds, I can't even speak today, all kinds of lessons. Some of those are really good lessons, and some of them aren't really all that good. So what did you learn from your family that was good and bad? Yeah, I learned the good stuff I learned like hard work, graft, have strength, always have a dream, never ever give up on your dream regardless of what anybody says to you because a lot of people have either had their own dreams blown or they no longer believe in their own dreams so they kind of offset on offset that onto you Um, always just work hard if you dream and it's possible there's always a way it may seem hard at first but there's always a way to work it out just keep on trying be persistent consistent and loads of prayer and you'll get there so those are like if you say like the main things I've learned um and enjoy your food as well definitely enjoy your food <laughs> I would say definitely <laughs> those are amazing lessons aren't they yeah and you learn them from being very young yeah always wow always because I remember I used to do swimming we used to do swimming when I was age five and six because in the summer we used to go to Jamaica for holidays and it was like, if you're going to go to Jamaica, you need to know how to swim. You can't just go there and not swim. But a lot of people from the island can't swim anyway, so I couldn't understand. But I'm glad I can swim because it's one of my favourite things to do. Um, those are like the good stuff. Just a lot of hard work, graft and keep going. Um, mm, negative stuff. Mm, I can't really think. I can't really think of like negative stuff or wow you, you had an amazing family what can I say so yeah. I know Leanne that for almost 10 years you actually worked as an investigator didn't yes. you for the local government so yes tell us about that time in your life and what yeah. that was like working as an investigator mm -hmm. with fraud mm -hmm. yes yeah, so that was in some ways it was the best 10 years of my life and then also some of those years were the worst times as well so I remember like I was just like I'd finished uni I'd done a kind of you know you do a bit of temping work out of uni and stuff and I thought I actually want a permanent job I don't want to be bouncing around offices each week and making friends and then you're gone again or they said you only want to the end of the week and then I wanted some permanency so I thought okay I'd have to go to NHS I didn't want to be a school teacher um I just didn't like the reports and the parents and the oh I just didn't like all that and I thought I could go to the council and try and get a job with my qualifications because I've got a law and psychology degree and then a master's in criminology and forensic psychology so I thought let me try and do something with this and at the same time I was also working as a magistrate too so I thought let me just try and apply I've never got a council job before hopefully I'll get it and I did the interview you know you can just feel there's a fusion when you're going for an interview there's a right vibe and I thought 
if I haven't got this job, I've made a good contact. So when I do apply again, hopefully I'll get it. But I got the job and I'd done a few jobs before. The end job that I was doing was um, investigating corruption and fraud. And, and what you what you see is, is you see when there's trust and when there's greed and, and there's the breach of trust, that's when you have a lot of fraud uh, and thieving going on and... Um, you know, just people trying to take things which they're not actually owed. There were so many cases like, oh, my goodness me. Some of the cases were just absolutely ridiculous. So things like mismanaging the timesheet, which was just ridiculous. Like, why would you do that? Just if you're supposed to be in at eight, be in at eight. Don't ask your teammate to sign you in at eight and you waltz in at half ten. Come on, like, things like that. Then other bigger cases where people are given huge budgets, multi-million pound budgets, mismanage the funds and stuff like that and then when they're asked some question they make up another fairy story like they work for Disney you know just just things just you know just things like that and it's like what what I loved about it was I love finding out stuff so I love you know at the time I used to use all different things like Facebook Instagram all these different searches to find out who's doing what who's pretending to be who who's saying they're off sick and they're not and all these different things it was such a huge catalogue of cases and I love that either but when I look back it's either you change your environment or your environment changes you so then I'm it's like you're faced daily with this kind of extreme side of um of a very I don't know like a very greedy side of life a very uh you know crime daily and that was my norm because <clears throat> I'd go to work investigate all these cases and I'd also go to magistrates court and hear all these different types of criminal cases so that was my norm so for me it was normal if someone would give me their your name see if you told me your name was Julie Mann once I've left the conversation I'll just go and do a search it was just so automatic to just go and do a, a search for who this person is and all these diff just anything so that became normal to just double check what someone just said and then question them so rather than take people at face value so it's a good thing and a bad thing at the same way but I always have those skills to always check and double check and research things and compare things and then always be able to set a case in 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 the best way possible definitely it was great it was great I must say it's great. if it's, a, it's an area that you're interested in do it but I say don't stay in those industries for too long once your heart has gone because my heart had gone and I'm like I really want to tap into this creative side I've done the logistics the the analytical side working out who's done who and, and I was really um fatiguing myself because I really wanted to jump in to the creative side because you know you may like back in the day yeah you might have had one career forever and a day but things have changed so vastly that we're doing so many different things like you know you've got one person who does this they do this they do this and I love that you get choice to do a number of different things so can you remember the point then when your heart wasn't in it can you remember what happened I'd say it was definitely a gradual, a gradual pullback. Like there'd be a case where there was someone, where there was a lady who had had quite a stressful time with uh, uh, pregnancy and stuff like that. And then she was misusing a document to park and stuff. She knew what she was doing. So, you know, when there's the mitigating emotional side, I thought, you know what, I can really relate to this lady and I can understand the role that I've got to do. And I'm like, I don't want to be Mrs. or Madam Enforcer anymore. Um, I, I could feel it then and that was like a few years before I'd left I was kind of slowly but surely thinking I just this is not really sitting right with me and you know if you're doing something that doesn't sit right with you within your heart within your mind you've got to make a change because you're going to keep fighting yourself and that's the worst person to fight yourself so was, I remember that case I was like mm, I don't feel so great about the decision not that it was my final decision but just the whole situation of it other cases where people were having lots of different issues and stuff like illnesses or blatant lies in your face and things like that and I was like I don't think this is an environment I want to I don't feel like this is getting me out of bed anymore that's what I kind of felt I don't think this is let me jump out of bed and be excited that okay I'm gonna go and get to see these people it's a great job if you love it and your heart is in it that's in anything if your heart's not in it it's probably best to um you know call it a night that's with anything in life no oh, i totally agree so you decided that it was time to make a change so did you immediately then decide to work with your voice what happened you know what right when i look back people have been telling me to use my voice for a long time but because i was so ingrained in 
um, you know, doing the investigative work, doing the magistrate work, and I'd done my degree and all of that stuff had kind of led me into that role. I couldn't really uh, understand what people were saying. They kept saying to me, I remember this, even at uni, I remember one tutorial, one of the, um, one of my tutors, I was one of this, one of my favorite barristers that she is now. She said to me, oh, we used to read out aloud, you know, you got to read out loud in tutorial. And she was like, oh, Leanne, your voice is very soothing and calm and you should really do something with it. So I couldn't really understand that as a compliment at the time. So I was like, why is she telling me to do something with my voice? She knows I'm here to study, I think it was like property law. I want to go and, you know, be a judge. I want to go and investigate stuff. I, I couldn't understand it while she was saying that. Um, and then, and then, and then when I look back, other people have said, oh, you should try and do something with your voice. It's very soothing and calming. But I didn't know anyone in the industry to say, I didn't know anyone personally. Of course, I've always been exposed to voices because you hear adverts all the time, but I didn't know how you got into it. And I didn't have a dance and drama kind of background and all of that stuff. So I kind of thought, I don't know how I'm going to do it. So I'd always been doing some type of business thing. I had a market stall at Portobello Road Market selling handbags made from magazines and photographs. I'd, you know, done jewellery. I'd always tried to do something. So I've always had this creative edge. But when the time came in 2016, when they were handing out voluntary redundancies, I said, you know what? This is the time to do the only business that I've never actually tried, that everyone tells me to try. And I thought, rather than looking at different products to sell or things like that, I'm going to look within and start a business from within. And that's why I was like, you know, I'm going to try and do something with this voice. That everyone tells me, Leanne, you should do something with your voice. And so I thought, I'm going to try it. I'm going to just take the money from the voluntary redundancy, set up my own business, get training, set up a studio, set up a website, whatever it is, I'm just going all in. I was like, I, I don't have any responsibilities. You know, I don't, I'm not married, I don't have children all that time at the time. And I was like, I'm just going all in and to see what can happen. And then, so I, I did that 2016, had no clue what I was doing, but that was the fun thing of it. Learning on the go, meeting new people, different pet and me, the little gems that I had to help other people. It was brilliant when I started and it still is now. And then it's evolved from just doing voiceover because when I was doing the voiceover, you know, you're putting out material, adverts and promos and people message me. And I'd be like, why are they asking me things about how do I speak with this? And how do I speak with more confidence? How do I control my breathing? All these different things. So I was like, I don't know why they're asking me stuff. I just want to read for adverts. And then more and more of these conversations would come in on the DMs and stuff. And I thought, you know what? Rather than kind of responding, responding individually, I thought I'm going to put together some packages. When those responses come or those questions come, I'm going to like try and help people and say, listen, I've got this product. I've got this ebook or audio book, et cetera. Would you like to, you know, to have it and stuff? So that's what I, I did. And that's how it kind of evolved as well into doing voiceover and the speaking coach as well. I would have never thought I'd do speaking coach. I was just like, I'm just going to record. Just want to do a galaxy chocolate advert. That's all I want. That's all I want. Um, and then, um, but the speaking coaching kind of, I don't know, organically evolved out of it as well. Yeah. Wow. I love your story. And uh, yeah, it was organic, wasn't it? The way it happened. And clearly you'd been listening, listening, listening all that time. And that's such an yeah. important skill, isn't it? But I really love your attitude that you'll just kind of have a go. So yeah. obviously, you know, life has its challenges and you must have had challenges. So what would you say are the most difficult challenges you've had or a difficult challenge you've had? Mm. And how did you deal with that challenge and overcome yeah. it? Yeah, like uh, there's, there's so, uh, you know, me, I 100% love challenges never run from the challenge run into it you know jump over them like hurdles I always see it as and I remember when this is when going wheeling the clock all the way back when I was um was I 10 or 11 I think I was I think I was about 11 and the careers advisor would come into school and give you advice about what you're going to do and um, she came in and I told her, I want to be a judge, you know, I want to be a judge, I want to do law, I want to do a judge. And she was like, oh, no. She said, um, be more realistic. I remember her telling me, be more realistic. She said, girls like you, it's not going to happen for you. You need to be more realistic. Try to think of doing like being a secretary or doing admin, something more within like your set, your your sector, people, you know, a girl like you. And I was like, what do you mean? I, I didn't understand it. So I didn't really, I didn't know at 11 that she was kind of telling me like being a young black girl, there's no way you can aspire to do, get a law degree, do anything like that. But she didn't use those words. 
It was when I went back and I told my mum and she was like, no, 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 that's not going to happen. So my mum went down to the school. And at the time I was like, I don't want to fuss. I don't want everyone to know that I kicked off about the careers advice and stuff. And that just showed me that even if people say something that may go against your dream, if that's the dream that's been put in your heart, you need to go with it. You need to run with it or whichever way you can do it, do it. Find a way. There's always a way. It may not be straight. It may be wiggly wonkly. There's always a way. So I remember if I had listened to that lady when I was 11 who told me someone like you, there's no point you having a law degree because you're not going to do anything with it. That's what she basically told me. I would have never have achieved getting a law degree, getting a master's, doing the magistrate's work, being investigated, you know, all of these different stuff if I had just listened to her. So things like that, like um, overcoming that challenge as well of like negative people, people who think they're doing good, um, but um, really learning that you've got to really listen to the voice inside. What are the dreams that's been put in your heart? Because only you can bring them forward. And I never want to be that person. I remember reading a Les Brown quote. He said, you don't want to be that person who's at the cemetery and you've got all of your dreams having a row with you, telling you, we were given to you and you did not bring us to fruit. And now we're here stuck with you. We didn't get to birth. I don't want to have that conversation with any dreams at my cemetery grave. I want to just lay down in peace. I don't want any arguments do you know what I mean so I always remember that I always remember that so any hurdles just always see them as like just got to overcome them um I remember when uh what else what else there's so many stuff I can think of as well um I remember even even last year I was a bit sick last year for the majority of the year I know it was locked down for everyone but um, I was a bit sick last year and I was like you know what what can I do a small thing and I just write out like a little daily chart of like three things that I can achieve and then three things I can be grateful for so then I wouldn't kind of feel like oh woe is me I need to go into hospital I'm sick etc I'd always just think like I'd always think like where was I this time last year and where can I be this time next year and just always look at grateful notes and stuff and just write grateful notes down and that would really help me because like, I was sick from like I don't even know February all the way to like October I was like I need to get better by November because that's my birthday do you know what I'm saying um, and I was like if I can just look back on this time and think okay if I can still work all the way through and if I can still um, you know just still make it happen and uh, not let this sickness take me out. I know I can do anything. Anything is possible if you believe. That's what it says in like Mark 9, 23. I just thought, you know what? If I've been given these hurdles, I know, yeah, that God has given me strength. So like, I'm going to throw this hurdle at you. Okay, what am I going to do? I'm going to let it knock me over or I'm going to get up. I'm going to jump over it. So stuff like that. Just run, run into the battle, 110%. Don't be like, ooh, run into the battle, run into I the battle. I love what you've said, Leanne, and I totally agree with everything you've said. And actually, even though I might not express it in that way, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm a total believer in, um, you know, go for it, don't stay in your comfort mm -hmm. zone. But also, the power of gratitude is so important. And what yeah. you said about the journey, you know, a straight line, never a straight line. You know, one step forward, two steps back. But actually, as long as you keep getting up every time you get knocked over, yeah, that's the thing. So you've touched on the fact that you do teach people now how to use their voice. Now, you know, I, I'm, I've worked as a voiceover artist myself, and I know there are so many people who absolutely hate their voices and they cannot bear the thought of listening to their own voice. What do you say to people like that? Yeah, so there are so many people that hate their voice, but... Now, and, and this was only when I was doing the voiceover stuff did I learn this. So you hear your voice twice. So inside you, you've got these little tiny, delicate bones and stuff. So you hear your, vo your voice inside your inner ear. Then you hear the outside auditory version. So what it is you don't like is you, you're used to hearing the one inside your ear. And then when you hear the one outside where maybe you hear it on a Zoom recording or you hear it on the phone or you hear it on TV, you're like, who's that? I don't like that because that the, the external auditory one sounds different because it's gone into impact with going through distance and sound waves and stuff, which is different from how you usually hear your voice inside your ear. So that's why a lot of people hate their voice. And secondly, as well, a lot of people I feel suffer with the imposter syndrome where they're thinking like, oh, I don't deserve to be doing this training. I'm not qualified. There's so many more people that sound better than me. I don't have this. You know, all the I don'ts, I don'ts, I don'ts, I don'ts, all this negative, negative voice. And how I help my um, friends or students, whatever you want to call them, I will say when those negative voices or feelings come up, because a lot of people can express it comes up as anxiety feelings, 
you need to tell that voice which says you can't talk on the zoom nobody wants to hear from you what i do is i say um, which i learned from one of my other friends called marissa bailey she said that what it is is when those negative voices come up you need to tell them and my negative voice, I give her a name. So mine is called Sasha. So when Sasha tries to rise up and say, oh, Leanne, you can't go for that big advert there. You've never booked that bigger client before. I say to Sasha, oh, Sasha, like as if we're in a court of law. Oh, Sasha, what evidence have you got that I can't book that? And of course, Sasha's got no evidence that I can't book that type of client. So in that way, you just get to kind of quiet and shh that um, imposter syndrome voice. So that is one that is a big thing as well for people who hate their voice because often they've got a negative voice already inside saying you can't do that, you don't sound good, your accent is off, you talk too fast, all the different things that you can say to you. So those two things, because of the way how your ears and the auditory works outside and the imposter syndrome, I found are the two big things that happen with the ladies that I'm working with. Great point. And there was actually many, many years ago, I hated my voice. And at that time, I was working as a voiceover artist. And then people kept telling me how great my voice was. It was only when I did some personal development that I could actually be with my voice. Now I really like my voice, but it's really amazing what other people hear and, you know, the way you interpret your own voice. And um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a fantastic point that you brought up. And I'm just wondering, there might be people watching, Leanne, who, you know, maybe they've got to do some public speaking. Well, maybe they too would like to become a professional voiceover artist. So what tips might you give them? So uh, to be a voiceover, I think definitely go for it. Firstly, uh, first, first point, do not run out and get a demo. You just don't need it at the first book call because you don't have enough uh, experience or evidence, a, a good uh, booking quality, I would say, to put it on a demo. Yeah, that would be my first thing get some coaching, get some training, go to workshops, read out loud every day, work out where your voice suits. Like, do you have that nice Joanna Lumley voice or do you have a radio advert promo voice? Do you have an audiobook voice? Work out where your voice is and get lots of training and get lots of ears on your voice. So I'd say that's the first thing. Um, do lots of reading out loud and as well with voiceover it's not just the voice it's your whole body because everybody knows when you're ill you sound squeaky your throat is sore it comes out through your voice look after your health like all natural products you know use ginger use lemon drink hot water really look after your voice because it's a whole kind of um it's an all-in-one package it's not just you've got a great voice you need a whole great looking after your body as well it's a whole thing like that and then in regards to public speaking some tips there I think everybody can be a great public speaker I think what needs to be done is to some things say it out loud in your mind that people want to hear what you're going to say and um, a lot of it now is all online so you don't have to worry you do need to still have it as a focus you don't need to worry so much about your body language like what is your whole body saying is your leg doing that nervous tap you know sometimes you can be doing a nervous tap and you don't even know so I think um what is great is now I originally learned this as eye contact but when you do face-to-face -face talks more than just eye contact eye contact it's the eye connection which I learned from one of my podcast guests who says you don't just kind of look and look and look like that you kind of look and speak to that person and hold the gaze for about three or so seconds to really get that person to engage in you then you move on not just rush and get all the eyes so I'd say definitely it's about being prepared practicing know your topic have eye contact really give yourself don't try and pretend to be anybody else and really know who your audience is if that means you go out or you check who's going to be listening find out who's going to be listening so you can give examples that are relatable to that person um, and don't be just a facts a fact machine we have google for that we want to know the value give your heart people love a story we all love stories as a little kid we want to know the story. Where's a big kid? We still love stories. So don't kill people with facts. Even if you do have a dominant factual basis, wrap up those data in stories. Always deliver in a story. People remember the story, not that this quarter you had this much figures and that. No, they'll remember the story. Always give the information, the talk in a story or have very relatable examples. Fantastic tips. Thank you. Why do you do what you do? You know, I love, I love talking 
And I also love to help others to speak with much more confidence. Because for me, I find it easy to talk, to share, to talk about what's going on um, in my mind or in the voiceover stuff. I love to, you know, just bring to life text. Because there's any type of text you can read. And some people read it, it sounds so boring. You're like, oh, I'm not interested in that at all. But there's some texts that look like, I'll think, oh, that doesn't look good. I can read stuff and make it just come to life because I used to do it a lot as a kid. So I do, I do, because I want to, when I talk about the voiceover stuff, I want to create a picture in your ear with my voice. That's what I say I do with my voiceover stuff. And then in regards to why do I help women in business speak with more confidence? Because I often find they're very highly skilled women in corporate jobs, but they haven't got to that top part or not climbing because they don't believe in themselves. And that comes out in what they say or how they say or what they even do not say. Particularly when they're going for these interviews, they don't deliver and express themselves correctly, not showing how great they are and stuff like that, showing the confidence. Whereas you see their counterpart male, maybe just, yeah, I'm this, I'm that, I'm et cetera, I'm brilliant. And um, so to really help women to the, be the best women they can be. And humans are one of the only ones, I think we're the only species that talks. Other species talk with different communication skills, but that's why if we don't master this bill of talking and also listening, you're just going to find it hard, a whole total struggle through life for no reason. So I do that to really help women grow in confidence when they're in work or in their business or just in life in general. Love it. And I'm going to obviously put your links below this video so people can check you out and find out more information and get in touch if they'd like to do that. You've talked about many, many fantastic lessons that you've learned throughout your life. Of all the lessons, though, that you have learned, which one are you most grateful for? Hmm. I think love. I think the lesson of love. Love first for yourself. Because if you don't love yourself, you can't love anybody else, you know. And that's really clear in the way how people treat each other. I think the key lesson that I've learned in life is, is to love myself, love others, and love can cover like a multitude of sins. Do you know what I mean? Because, you know, yes, you can hold grudges and stuff, but what's the point? It just gives you heart pain, angina, high blood pressure, stress. What is the point? So that's why I think love, it's for me, it's an action. Others, it may be a word. I think the biggest lesson I've learned is to do everything in love. Do what you love. Make sure you love yourself or you cannot. You cannot love others. Brilliant. One last question, Leanne. When you're no longer on this planet, how would you like people to remember you? Oh, I want to be remembered as the girl that, the girl that made them feel comforted and soothed by their voice and also gave them their confidence in their own voice. Gorgeous. It's been an absolute pleasure. Leanne Turner, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you so much, Julie.